Hello, and welcome back to the WordPress Edge podcast, taking you to the edge of WordPress. This is the ultimate destination for professionals looking to harness the power of WordPress for large-scale enterprise solutions. I'm your host, Landon DePasquale, enterprise web strategist here at AmericanEagle.com. In this episode, we're going to the edge to discuss the future of enterprise WordPress. And I am incredibly happy to be joined by Jason Cohen, founder and chief innovation officer over at WP Engine. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Happy to be here. So Jason, um, when we started kicking off the topic for this, uh, we kicked around a few different ideas and we ultimately settled on the future of enterprise WordPress. Where do you see WordPress heading? Well, I think it's a mixture of where's WordPress heading and where's everything heading. Um, you know, the whole world is moving towards more no code, low code stuff. Obviously, there's AI, which is maybe even boring to talk about at this point, but it's it's happening. That's 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 for sure. Um, I think consumers are expecting better and better designs and experiences from anything online. Um, I think people are expecting more um, even ethical behavior from organizations and companies, whether that's the brands they buy from or other people involved in the process. I think those are all secular trends. And so WordPress is caught up in that. Um, so for example, all the stuff with the new editor um, goes right to the low code sort of stuff where maybe developers can make some of those components and that's the code part, but marketers are much more empowered to assemble things and remix things and so on without having to write code, which is amazing. Or um, obviously in some of these, uh, uh, some of these things about uh, being ethical or having an open web, that's obviously a place where WordPress shines, always has been, always has shown in those areas and, and continues to. Um, and in things like AI, I think it's a challenge for everyone. I don't think that's like a WordPress versus other thing question. It's just a hard question of what does that mean for content? What does it mean for coding? What does it mean and for how people's jobs work? What kinds of jobs you have? What you're expected to do in your job? Like it has all these things, which is really not relevant to WordPress specifically, um, like like calling out WordPress somehow, but still WordPress is is, is involved in all that. And, and so it matters. Um, so... To me, all these kind of secular trends have to be part of the answer of what is the future of WordPress? How does it fit into that? In which ways does it ride those tailwinds, like maybe in things like being open source and open? Where does it have headwinds? Like I think actually everyone, for everyone, AI is, they say it's quote unquote an opportunity. I think for most people, it's scary and strange, no matter who you are. It's like, we don't, we don't know what to do with this, but it sounds like it could be bad as well as good. And so you might call that a headwind or something new to contend with that might be different than the roadmap you had originally, right? Um, and so, so then where's Word, what about WordPress, the project outside of that? So obvi obviously, it's, it's about the editor. This um, is an interesting and, point you're making. Is WordPress, yeah. WordPress is both a leader in some of these things, and it's also impacted by the broader, broader right. piece. How do you see WordPress fitting into that? Are they, what things are they guiding on and what things are they being influenced by? And you were about to mention well, the editor. I think that's, yeah, yeah the editor is clearly an area where it's leading. I say yeah. clearly because not only is it this incredibly rich area of development, both in core and also with people around core, what theme developers are doing and so on, but also other projects like Drupal have started to adopt it. Yeah. So if Drupal's bringing it in, I guess it's winning in <laughs> some sense now. You know, yeah. Um, now, of course, lots of tools have this concept. Um, Notion is made out of blocks. You know, there's even paper from Dropbox is sort of made out of blocks and so forth. Of course, not as extensible, not as open, it, you know, not as remixable and so forth, but still this notion of like, there's these atomic units that you remix in order to make some kind of content um, is a general concept. But the idea that marketers will use it, can use it for both long form content as well as other kinds of structured content, um, that's, perhaps uniquely WordPress. If not, it's very special. And uh, so I think it's leading in that sense of, because, I, you know, one of the strengths of WordPress is that, and weaknesses, actually, you could say, is that WordPress, you can write any code you want and have it be in there. Yeah. Well, that's the strength in that you can make the website do anything you want, theoretically. And it's a weakness in that you might have to write code to make the website do something that you want. You can also make you it know, do nice some thing terrible the things. Tools, like the Wixes and Squarespaces and Webflows of the world is that they do stuff for you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to do it yourself. The bad thing is they only do certain things for you. And yeah. if you want to go beyond that, which of course you always do end up wanting to go beyond that, then you can't. You just simply cannot. 
So WordPress is, of course, this different trade-off where um, that's less extreme. I'm like, we'll do everything, we'll, you know, we'll do these things for you completely, but then nothing else can be done. So WordPress takes a different tack and says, well, it's not okay to say, oh, you want to do X, it's literally impossible. Now, it might be easy, it might be hard, it might take code, it may not, but like, to just say it's impossible is not a great answer yeah. on, the, on the web today. So WordPress's tack is like, no, it's not impossible, it's just there can be a range of difficulty, obviously, but it's not going to be impossible. Um, but that does mean you're writing code and there's, there's, a, there's some development there. That's the flip side of that. Um, so on the one hand, that helps WordPress to deal with anything that comes. So there's a new tech, there's AI, there's whatever. You know, it's possible to deal with it. If you're on Webflow, I guess you'll just wait to see if Webflow does stuff with AI and what it is, and you'll just see if it's good or not and whenever, and it's just you're, you're a victim of whatever they decide to do or not do. With WordPress, that's not true. You can make your own things. You can look at all kinds of stuff the community is working on. There's all sorts of things you could decide to do if you want. So that kind of freedom to do what you want and ability to do what you want is, is, is powerful. Um, but there's no doubt that things like AI is, a, is, is a, I would say it's a, in many ways, for, for individual, I, again, I think it's a mixture of a headwind and a tailwind. There's obviously certain kinds of efficiencies you get, whether that's brainstorming or drafting when it comes to content, whether that's a, you know, a faster way to look up things when you're writing code, like rather than Stack Overflow or some other kind of nonsense web stuff, you can get right to it sometimes. There's a certain aspect like that where it's clearly speeding things up. Um, the ability to research stuff, and you have to be careful whether it's right or accurate, but often it, it is faster and, and easier to get a, a grip on things. On the other hand, anytime you have a roadmap, but then something happens and you have to change your roadmap, whatever that thing is, is I guess an obstacle, a challenge of a thing that's running against you because you have to change what you wanted to do. And AI is doing that. So whether it's products where they're having to you know, they're like, wow, I guess we have to have an AI thing or else we're behind, but we don't even know what that means and it's not that good. Well, that's kind of bad. <laughs> like yeah. Just throwing something in that's not very good. And then the excuse is, well, we have to figure it out. We have to play with it. And they're probably not wrong. It's just, this isn't great. This is a weird obstacle. This is a weird distraction at the moment. So, it's not providing value. Um, so it's that for WordPress too, like it is for everyone. I, you know, WordPress isn't special in that sense. Um, and uh, so that's interesting. I also think the low code is... A challenge for WordPress too, because sure, these other systems are limited, but the more capable they become, the less that limitation matters for certain segments of customers. So in other words, if my requirements for a website are fulfilled by, say, a Squarespace, and you say, but Squarespace can't do X, Y, and Z. And if, if I say, well, I don't care about X, Y, and Z, if I say that, then then Squarespace is a good platform for me, <laughs> you know, and I and I, I write less code. That's good. So as those platforms become more capable, more uh, uh, the people would say, oh, for my website, that's actually sufficient. Yeah. And so in that sense, that's a, that's a threat to WordPress. So there's always going to be tons of people who say, well, of course, I always need to be able to do stuff. I never want to be in a, in a corner where I can't do stuff. And there will always be millions and millions of people like that. So in that sense, that's safe. But still at the edges, at the margins of the simpler, uh, more common sites, you know, you could imagine like, is WordPress still the right answer for some of those? I mean, as the other platforms get better, then they're, then they're good solutions. Yeah, and I think in the context we're talking about, this is an interesting topic because as we think about enterprise, we think about WordPress really shining because of its flexibility and its ability yeah. to go beyond what, Squarespace and Wix and that sort of thing can do. So as you think yeah. about WordPress in that enterprise context, how do you see WordPress taking a central role in enterprise tech stacks or architectures? Oh, yeah. Yeah, all those other tools are irrelevant for, for enterprise. Um, WordPress has a couple of advantages over the enterprise systems. But what is its disadvantages? Um, when you have an Adobe or, or a, an Acquia, you have a lot of mature, sophisticated tools that can handle very complex use cases. Yep. And as an enterprise, you often have complex use cases. So you don't just have a marketing department. You have 37 marketing departments because different languages and countries. And you're not selling a product. You're selling a thousand products possibly with all kinds of stuff that needs to go with that. There may be governance and security and, and departments and things that have to be cut up. There may be many other systems you have to integrate with. So as an enterprise, you have all this stuff. Sure, these other systems are very expensive and complicated and they're hard to they're expensive to buy, they're expensive to run, et cetera, but they can tackle the complexity that you in fact have. <laughs> 
So that's a really big deal. Um, also, sometimes they can be the safe buy. Like we bought Adobe because they're the leaders, according to Gartner. Like that's a that's not necessarily a bad reason. Like you could say, no, you should analyze it and decide. And you're right, but it's not actually the worst decision. Like people make fun of that of making decisions to not get fired. They make fun of that. It's not irrational, and not just to not get fired, but because there is a reason that they're ranked high in Gartner. It's not for nothing at all. They are a good solution in many ways. Sure, they have problems, but so does everything. And you know that's not that's not a bad reason necessarily. So that's what, that's kind of the what WordPress is up against there. Um, but WordPress brings a whole lot of interesting things. And so for for many use cases, WordPress is in fact the right tool for the job. Not a hundred percent of them, of course, but in many there are. Um, some of it is in the stuff we were just talking about, the fact that it's so flexible and easy to write code and easy to do it quickly and even and reuse community stuff if, if you desire or make your own stuff if you, as you desire and be able to kind of assemble whatever, whatever it is that you um, that, that, that's right for you. When a system is much easier and faster to work with, you can build stuff faster, bring it to market faster. Not only is that useful just to be faster, but also it's typically cheaper if it's also faster. <laughs> I mean, if it takes three months instead of six months to do a thing, that's probably half the price to build. So that's good. Um, a great example of that is at WP Engine. We, uh, our own website, obviously it's WordPress, and uh, um, our new CMO, relatively new CMO, wanted to revamp the whole design, how everything's laid out, all the design, all the workflow, the, the flows, the user flows and stuff, and also switch to a headless WordPress. So he said, we're going to do this in four weeks. Everything I just said in four weeks, which is insane. With hundreds of millions of ARR yeah. and thousands of people working here. Like we're not a, we may not be McDonald's, but we are not a small operation where that's a trivial thing to yeah. do. Okay. <laughs> so he said, we're going to do it in four weeks. We were like, what? That's impossible. It was done in four and a half weeks. So, I mean, <laughs> this, right? So, when you have a when you have technology and a platform, a technology and WordPress and a platform like WP Engine, that is that flexible and fast to do things, that's incredibly valuable, yeah. both in terms of getting things to market quickly, but also the expense of getting something to market at all. So, that's already a huge advantage over the enterprise system, you know, these enterprise level systems where everything's slow and hard. Again, they have advantages, but man, everything is slow and hard. Yep. And being fast, not only to be agile and change your mind, but just in terms of overall expense, that's quite useful. On the subject of expense, the other thing about WordPress is that WordPress, the software, is free. Yes. Like there's no software licensing fees. Yes. And uh, we talked about this before the call, but um, there's a phrase I love, which is open source is free like a puppy dog is free. So yeah, you get it for free, but then you gotta, you know, manage it and maintain it and yeah. do it and you, know, you take care of it, you know, et cetera. It's and then you realize free, how expensive it, you know? all so the I would say boarding two things. is. Yeah. So there's two things about that. One is that's true, but that's what WP Engine does. Yeah. Like we we handle all that stuff. Yeah. So that that's the other side of it. Okay, so the fair enough, but but you there's help for that. And the other side of that is it's not like Adobe has no maintenance and no management. What? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> you know, like everything, everything in software has management and maintenance. So you're right. Open source has that. And there's no doubt. But it's not like other things don't. <laughs> you know. So um, anyway, but the fact remains that the software is free, that the software doesn't have licensing fees. So you could take that million or $2 million you were going to pay for software licensing fees alone and do something else with it. One thing you could do is save it. In other words, just uh, the project, whatever it is, can be cheaper. And, and yeah. nowadays, with the economy the way it is and yeah. financing being difficult, things being cheaper just straight up are is great to hear. Now, sometimes the economy is like that, sometimes it's not. But in general, yeah, in general, we don't want to just spend money that we don't need to spend, especially at that scale. So one way is you could just save the money. Um, but that's actually not what I think generates the most value for a marketer because the, as a marketer, you're making this website, whether it's your homepage or it's a campaign or it's a product launch or whatever it is, you're making this website for a purpose. As a media company, you may be trying to get more page views because page views equals ads equals money. For an e-commerce, you're trying to get conversions or higher average you know, cart sizes or something because that's money. And for, for, a, for a brand company, you're trying to build a brand, maybe engagement, maybe signing up in some way for a social media thing or a lead um, or something like that. Like who, what, you're building the website for some specific reason. And that, so when I say your website needs to perform, 
I mean, whatever that means to you, like, like what I just listed, yeah. that, that has a specific meaning to a specific customer. That's what you want from the website. So here's two choices. One, you make a website that performs at some level, but it's cheaper than it would have been. Do you want that? Sure. <laughs> well, that's, that's the save money version of what you could do with, by, by using WordPress instead. But there's a, what I think an even more valuable option, which is what if you took that money you saved and instead of, I mean, save from not spending on licensing, right? And instead of just leaving it in the bank or the, or the budget, what if you spent it making this website perform better? So what if the website converted 20%, 30%, 50% better? What if it had more traffic? What if the conversion rate was better? What if you had better tools there? What if you had more tests there? What if you could try different things, et cetera? Um, so that rather than, so that you take the same budget, but get more performance out of it, wouldn't that be more valuable? I think it's almost always more valuable to generate those more leads, generate the, you know, and the way I like to say it sometimes is as the CMO, if you went to the CEO and said, we hit our numbers and we also saved a million dollars. The CEO will say, that is great. <laughs> and it is. But what if instead the CMO goes to the CEO and says, so we exceeded our lead gen for sales by 30%. So we, because of what we did, we, our whole company's growing 30% faster than expected. Which would you rather do? Save a million dollars or grow way faster than expected? That's an easy one. The second case by a mile is more valuable. So it's just a way to underscore this idea that you could save the money and there's nothing wrong with that. It's good to save money, like that's fine. But but spending that money on creating more performance, getting more results, that's probably even more valuable. Either way, the fact that WordPress is a more affordable option, either path you choose, <laughs> WordPress is, is helping to generate that value by by letting you repurpose this, these dollars in some more valuable way. No, I think that makes a ton of sense. And in an enterprise context, you're looking for WordPress to drive those sorts of marketing outcomes, right? And I think what right. we've seen, what we've seen is that WordPress does a great job of driving those marketing outcomes. I mean, do you have examples of really positive marketing outcomes you've seen that you've seen WordPress driving? Well, we have 170,000 customers. And so I have lots of examples of WordPress <laughs> driving outcomes. Um, and, and even on the and actually on the enterprise side, sometimes it's even more obvious because they're working at a scale where when you make a change, you really see a result. Yeah. And so, for example, um, we've had media companies. Some of these are case studies that I can talk about, where they switched to us. Maybe they maybe they used headless. Maybe they used some other things. And and the site sped up, um, and because of that, their SEO improved, and their time on site or number of clicks went yeah. up. And so with a combination of improved SEO, which, in, which increases traffic and increased number of clicks per person, the, the, you know, the sum total was like a 20 or 30% increase in page views, which because this is a media company means a 20, 30% increase in revenue. Yeah. So, you know, these, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, doing the work is hard and it's not trivial to try to increase your SEO. Like I'm not trying to say this is easy work. But the mechanism at the end of the day is pretty is pretty simple. If yeah. the site performs better in terms of speed and also, of course, in terms of design, um, then these numbers often go up. Same thing with ecom. There's a billion studies, right, that show that faster sites convert yeah. better. It, it just you, you know it, it's absolutely known. Um, now, what what is going to convert better? Which designs are going to be right? Okay, that's where the rubber hits the road, and it's hard to know. On the other hand, if you're able to try many things and be agile and test because it's inexpensive to do so, then you can, uh, in, a, in a certain amount of calendar time and budget, you can make so many more tests and things yeah. that it's much more likely that you will find that better thing than if you can only build one or two things over a period of six months. So it's not like, of course, WordPress was not, would not magically find the best design for you. <laughs> like Obviously not. But making it faster or cheaper to be fast and faster allows you to do the work that then lets you find out, let, discover which of those things really work. That, that is how WordPress indirectly um, does help you get to that final outcome. Yeah, I think that's absolutely huge. And you mentioned one of the kind of hot trending topics right now, which is headless. Um, we've probably seen examples where headless makes a ton of sense and other examples where it doesn't. In your opinion, yeah. what are those value discussions? What are those trade-offs? Where does that make sense? And where are those times where you look at that customer and just go, I realize you read headless somewhere, but this is not the right fit for you. Yeah, exactly. 
So all things are sets of trade-offs. And so it's good to say what they are. And then projects where that trade-off is right for the project is right. Otherwise it isn't. So what Headless does is it makes the site faster and more scalable. And also lets you use lots of modern technology, especially in the JavaScript world. Not that WordPress cannot, it can, but it's just much easier, much more natural. There's lots of examples. People already know how to do it. The tools are built for those things. It's just much easier and much more natural. So newer tech, uh, which, which does all kinds of different things, um, and performance and scale in general. That's what it affords you. The problem or the, the drawback is the development is much more difficult. You need React developers, you need JavaScript developers. Um, generally, those folks ha are, are, have more training. They might be more expensive. They may not have worked on websites before. <laughs> they may have been working on like apps or products or other things and so on. So, um, so it's a different set of people often. And, and uh, that's interesting. Like, do you have the right people on the team? Uh, if you're hiring people, is it more expensive? So it is a more expensive uh, sort of thing. Another thing that it does is WordPress has this massive ecosystem of stuff around it. But Headless makes half those things obsolete. Um, be, simply because WordPress, if WordPress doesn't control what goes in the browser, then any plugin or theme or anything whose act, action depends on putting something in the browser doesn't work because okay. WordPress is no longer putting stuff in the browser. Yep. So also you're reducing the amount of the WordPress ecosystem that you can leverage. And that was one of the things we just said was great about WordPress is leveraging the stuff in the ecosystem. So it's like, okay, um, that's that was one of the advantages of WordPress and Headless removes that advantage somewhat, you know, not completely, but a lot. So if you were depending on that and that's not there anymore, that's a drawback. Yeah. So there are certain, so what, so those to me are the major trade-offs. So you could take any project and ask, is this trade-off worth it? But just to give an example of some things where I think it's often it is worth it would be any kind of e-com or media site. Yeah. Because in e-com and media, things like speed and scale are so vital for it succeeding kind of for the reasons we 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 just said <laughs> it's just so fundamental to whether the business model works. Yep. So for example, if I'm mcdonalds.com, maybe I don't really care like people are going to go there if they go there. I'm not trying to be found in SEO. <laughs> That's not the deal, you know. So like it's just not on my mind, you know. And it's not important. You're right. It's not that important. But in media or e-com, you have to be found. You have to capture those eyes. You've got to be doing these things like SEO. And once they're there, you want it to be this great experience because otherwise your business model itself doesn't work. So when that's the case, when the dollars and cents of your business model are tied to the performance and maybe even customization or personalization of your website is directly tied to your revenue, then that stuff about, but the developers might be a little bit more expensive. It's like, well, too bad because this is, we've got to win yeah. selling our widget or we got to win when the news breaks. And there's 20 of us putting the story out. We've somehow got to be in the top three. Yeah, we have to. So you know, and so so when you have that attitude, um, then this trade-off uh, maybe sounds good. I'll say one more thing about like uh, characterizing, as you say, like what's headless good for? Who's it good for? Because we just now talked about a little bit of the technology and use cases, which is useful. Another thing is the attitude toward technology of the entity. So yes. let me let me explain. Um, Using the terminology of Jeffrey Moore from Crossing the Chasm, which is, it's an old book that um, has been sort of used and abused and repeated and, and morphed so much that maybe it's like, uh, it feels like you've said a word too many times, it doesn't mean anything, you know? Sure. So, uh, but but at the expense, at the, at the risk of, of invoking that, um, one of the things I think he definitely got right, and I've seen in my, you know, I've been in startups now and companies for about 25 years now, I, I, I see this as being true in my experience, is that you have uh, when you have a new tech like Headless is, relatively new, you have a group of what he calls early adopters, people willing to take on new tech. But most people are not willing to take on new tech. They want to wait until it's a known quantity and there's case studies and their rivals are starting to do it. So they feel like they have to just to stay, you know, just to stay in the same place, much less get ahead. Um, there should be consultants who do it. There should be best practices. They want to see Gartner saying it's a good idea. In other words, they want all this reassurance that it's good to go before they will adopt the tech. As put, and, and that's they, he calls that the majority or the early majority. And then there's these early adopters who just want to take the tech. I do believe that that is roughly true. Yeah. One of the things he says about that then is 
why then would an early adopter do this? Why would they take a risk on new tech? Because you're right, new tech is a risk, isn't it? <laughs> like, is it a risk? It doesn't work. It has a security problem. It breaks. Maybe, maybe the trends move away from that and it's short-lived and now you've got a website on some tech that no one cares about. Those are risks. This, that's not an irrational, you know, it's easy to make fun of the majority and say, oh man, you, you're so dumb. You don't take the new tech. And, you know, it's easy to say that if we're, especially technologists, it's easy for us to say, right? Because we like new stuff. Um, but it is a risk and maybe they shouldn't be taking that risk. How does that help their business to take a big ass risk on what tech to work on their website? Why should they do that? Yeah. <laughs> like, that's not irrational at all. So why would an early adopter do that? Well, one reason could simply be a culture. So for example, many times high tech companies have a culture of using new tech because that's what they do. They are, they themselves are new tech. Yeah. <laughs> and so the idea of using new tech on their website is like, well, duh, that's just who we are. So there could be a cultural reason like that. And indeed, a lot of times head, people who use headless are like software co develop software companies. Yeah. Why? They need headless? Well, they're just comfortable there and they don't, you know, like yeah. it's okay. Cause you know, so there could be a culture reason. But the reason that's more often I find, and especially with like headless, bringing it back to that, who bites headless? It's early adopters, but they're people who say, yes, that is a technology risk. I agree. But it's so impactful to my business that I'm willing to take on that technology risk and of course the expense of doing it. I'm willing to invest in that sense and take that risk because the effect on my business is so large that that's worth it. Yeah. So I think that's a nice way to think of it from a business model perspective as opposed to a use case or vertical perspective sure. like is it is it econ is is it would these benefits of things like speed and scale and the new tech and you know these things we said that it did would that deliver, confer such business benefits that the risk and expense is, is still a smart business decision? Now, they still may not want to do it, right? But like, at least that puts them in the potential category of an early adopter where it's rational for them to take the risk. Once again, I would pull up media and e-commerce as being examples because it's so cutthroat. It's so hard to get views and, and attention as media. And the, the ground's always shifting underneath you and SEO's always changing and there's social media it's so hard so yeah like probably oh we're gonna risk the website a little bit well if we don't we're just gone we're just yeah. invisible like we have to you know and, and again in e-commerce it can often be a similar kind of attitude so so those verticals make sense in terms of the trade-offs but they could also make sense with this business model early adopter argument so i know i went on and on about that but I do think it provides some specific lenses for deciding whether headless is right because you can look Absolutely. at the business model case and you can also look at the vertical or you know the vertical case and decide and also i think this model isn't just for headless like you could ask this about lots of different yeah. kinds of tech so I, I feel like this is a good mental model and in enterprise you will find that most people are not early adopters and some are and most are not and so that's where a lot of the market is that's good to know but also the ones that are early adopters are exciting, they're fun to work with, they often want to build new websites, and so it actually can be quite lucrative, quite fun, quite great. Even though there's fewer of them in number, there's a lot of money to be made there and a lot of exciting things there. So I wouldn't say one's quote unquote better than another, they're sure. just different kinds of things. And so when you think about, I'm working in the enterprise, I'm building websites quote unquote for the enterprise, I think taking this early adopter versus majority uh, and, and knowing who you're talking to, it changes everything from how you pitch yeah. What you what you're yep. promising, what uh, and and what they may want to say yes or no to. Sure. Headless being one of them, but only one of the thing. You know. Yeah. And so I feel like it's just a great mental model as in any kind of sale to the enterprise. Hey, who am I talking to here? Um, I'm, because if I'm talking to an early adopter, I'm going to be emphasizing what it can do for their business. I mean, I'm going to say what it can do for the business anyway. But I'm going to be really talking about you know you'll be the first one of your competitors to do this. So you're just going to get ahead. Like whatever advantages this confers, you're going to have it in there not. Yeah. That's the early adopter argument. Pretty good. Yeah. On the other side, you're going to want to bring in your case studies and bring yeah. in your proof points and bring in your ba 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 and show them how safe and smart this is. How they're this is the safe smart thing to do. You're going to want to say. Yep. Just a different it's just a different a different case a different case to make. So it's so useful to keep that in mind as you make that case. No, I think that makes a ton of sense and one of the interesting things you mentioned about headless is that it starts to grow beyond WordPress. And I think given what enterprises need, there's also some real value in WordPress 
as WordPress to it. And I think that is, you mentioned at the beginning, the block editor, right? Some of the changes that have been made to what was previously called Gutenberg. Some of us might have called it the best content editing experience on the web. Um, it is a fantastic offering for enterprise. How have you seen that uh, have a positive impact on, on enterprise clients? I would say one thing about enterprise tools in general is that they are not very empowering for the end users. Whether By design. It's workday, you know, Workday, whether it's, you know, Salesforce, whether it's uh, Adobe or whether it's one of, one of the, uh, the enterprise headless CMSs like Contentful. They're not built for the end user. They're built for the people who buy the stuff. Like Workday is built so that this, so that the head of HR wants to buy it. Yeah. <laughs> it's not built yeah. so that so, so, so a line of employees thinks this is very helpful to them. That's not what it's built for, and so forth. Um, and so, so what's one of the things I find about Gut, maybe WordPress in general, Gutenberg certainly is that it's empowering to the marketer. Yeah. Hey. You can make anything you want, make it look like what you want, rearrange how you want, do layouts, did, did, did. things where otherwise you might have to ask a developer to do it, or it's just not possible, blah, blah, blah. All of a sudden you can. The answer is yes, you can probably do that because this is such a flexible system. And the other, and, and that's not normal in enterprise. With Adobe, you can't do that. You have to rely on the developer opening yep. Jira tickets. It takes forever. It's very expensive. That's what it's like. And with Gutenberg, it's like, I can do it myself, like in the next 15 minutes. That is so incredibly empowering. You could say it's efficient and it's the, and it is, it is efficient. You can get more done in the same money. And so like, if you want to take that view, it is, but I'm taking a, a more human view. Oh my God, I can finally do something on my own. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> That's wonderful. And as an enterprise, I should want that from my marketers. I don't yeah. want my marketers have to go through hoops and spend lots of money to yeah. make 20 landing pages. I want them to just make 20 landing pages and try it. Of course, that's what I want, you know? So is it more efficient to make 20 million pages? Yeah, but like also on a human level, isn't it just better, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and more fun and more productive, but in a good way, not more productive in some sort of weird, you know, evil mechanistic way. It's more productive because it's also just like, I, I can just do my damn job, you <laughs> yeah. know? That's a good reason, <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, WordPress kind of has that in its soul. And in particular, uh, it's in the editor. Um, a couple of years ago, having that and headless at the same time was hard. But now, especially with with uh, with Faust uh, JS, which is our um, open source uh, framework for headless WordPress, and again, fully open source, you can do whatever you want with it. You don't have to pay us anything, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, uh, uh, you it brings Gutenberg into the headless yeah. world too. So the markers can do the stuff, and it makes sense. And, and as React components, like native normal React components nothing strange on the front end and it's like, like translation layer among other things that it does so it really does take that that beautiful empowering thing and make sure that in the headless context that still works but whether it's headless or not um it is empowering marketers to to do something and i don't want to you know we don't have to over index just on that but um it is you know it's obviously the focal point of wordpress development for the last few years and yeah. will be i think for the next few years according to the current roadmap yeah so it's worth hanging on that for a while no i think that's right and that's a perfect transition into my last question for you, Jason, which is, what do you think WordPress is going to look like five years from now? And this is the part where we get to record this and then make fun of you five years from now when it's completely not accurate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, no one knows, right? Um, <laughs> so, I mean, which of these trends do I think are permanent? I think there will be more headless websites. I'm not going to say that most websites will be headless. I'm not saying that, but there will be more. Not, not fewer. Um, and so the capabilities of WordPress to support that use case, I think will improve. Um, I think the, I, I certainly hope that the current roadmap for, um, for, for, the, for the, uh, the block editor is fulfilled. And so I hope that yeah. we have a block editor that is multilingual, that is, that is collaborative, meaning by which I mean like live collaboration, which of yep. course they're working on designing right now. Um, I hope that works. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, 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 that's more accessible. Right now the block editor is hard to use if you're blind or if you have other uh, certain kind, certain disabilities. And uh, it would be nice if, if it was possible to use by everybody. I think that's one of the beautiful things about WordPress historically. It's to the, the, the mission statement is to democratize publishing and you might say the unspoken part is for everyone. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and maybe maybe that is tacit because and implied because it's not 
democratized publishing for this set, subset of humanity. And that's not sure. what, that's not its mission. And so things like accessibility is part of making a mission that really is for everybody. Um, and so is the multilingual, of course, um, having, having not just that you can do it, but that it's like really good that, uh, yeah. you know, it's very, it's easy to do and it's easy to keep maintain the languages and, you know, somehow AI is going to be in there now, how, okay. I don't, I, I don't know that I can predict it perfectly. I think as a writing assistant is the, is the really obvious thing. Maybe it's helping me draft. Maybe it's correcting grammar errors. Maybe I can say, make this a little shorter or a little longer, but keep my style. And it does. Um, it, once AI is, it, once some of these systems are better at um, being accurate, maybe it can even fact check for me or find some other references and links to put in. Maybe it can find other articles on my own site to link to. So there's a little more cross-referenced. It can even go back to older articles and amend them to point to newer stuff or otherwise do that. That could be interesting for that for certain kinds of sites. Um, for SEO, what will it, at the intersection of SEO and AI be? We don't know, but to the extent that it helps you with SEO, but in a positive way, like not in a spammy, crappy way, but in a good way, like I really do want people finding out about this if they search for this topic, yeah. then that can be good, you know? Um, so like I have an article about, um, you know, that rocks, pebbles sand analogy first sure. you got to fill up the jar with the rocks and then pebbles then sand otherwise blah 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 and i have a whole prioritization uh system in detail about that so i want to rank for rocks pebbles sand now not in a spammy way and i'm not trying to but yeah i mean i that'd be good like that's what it's about in a in a positive way so sure. like could it help that be true but in a good way you know with, yeah. with, without cheats um that could be good uh, multilingual is actually another interesting way that AI could help. Um, I would think that with the new kinds of systems that translations would actually work a lot better than they have in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and sure, probably you still need a human to check all that stuff, et cetera, but can it, can it dr dramatically increase the speed at which you can do it or the decrease the expense? Cause is the draft so good that it just takes a quick review to get it? If the answer is yes, then maybe websites today that are single language could become multilingual. Maybe websites could have a thing where you could try it, where it could auto translate in 80 languages, but actually be pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's another really interesting aspect of that, thinking about democratizing publishing in a, in a broader way. Sure, publishing like physically putting on the web, sure. But also just having a voice be heard at all. Not, yeah. not that you have, not that any one person has a right to put their voice in something else, but like the more people have that opportunity, that's yeah. nice. And, and and I think that 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 goes with the mission. So here's a really interesting idea. Um, I was listening to Jimmy Wales the other day, the the Wikipedia yep. founder, and they were he was being asked about AI and translation, and he was like, "Hey, so you have you know obviously English." Wikipedia is the big one. And then there's these other languages. And the question was like, hey, could you use AI to like make more articles for non-English based on the English ones? And people would still need to, of course, fix it, but could that help other languages fill out? And he said, yes, that's one of the things we'd like to see, because obviously that would that's absolutely the mission of Wiki, the Wikipedia as well. But then he had this really interesting point, which maybe works with WordPress too, which is he said, the other way is even more exciting. Because right now, there's a there's pages about little towns in Norway that are so small that no one in the English language Wikipedia would make one make a page about it, but it is in Norwegian. Mm. And there's tons of stuff like that yeah. where it's it's important to people who speak a language or et cetera and not in the English. And so most of the world will never find out about this yeah. thing because for them it doesn't exist. So going from Norwegian to English, perhaps perhaps surprisingly also can help that voice that place literally be put on the map <laughs> you yep. know, the wikipedia map anyway you know and 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 therefore make people's niching niche things smaller things be visible to more people yeah so i felt like that was a really beautiful idea and why why wouldn't that work in wordpress so it's not just Oh, w, you know, you know, I have a blog and now it could be in, in Norwegian. That would be cool. But what about people who write in beautifully in Norwegian and almost no one can hear their voice? Yeah. And with AI translation, maybe people can. You go the other way, it's it's also just a magical thing. And I, so I think again, like you hear AI in translation and you think, yeah, that could be more efficient, that's utilitarian. And it is, nothing wrong with that. But I think when you think about these kinds of things, you go, wow, maybe it could be more than just utilitarian. Yeah. Maybe that really is important with a capital I and helps human beings, you know, 
uh, talk to each other and say things. And that maybe is part of the mission of WordPress and a good thing. And at the end of the day, it's about dollars and cents. We got to sell websites to enterprises and they've got to make money <laughs> stuff. So no, no problem. No problem. You know, like that, that's right. But when there is that higher purpose and there's other things that can happen, that is that is also a beautiful thing. And it kind of makes the whole package, including the commercial stuff, just feel really good. Sure. That we're, they, all of this is going to a good thing. It, it, all the boxes are ticked. So in the next five years, if we could have some of that stuff, um, I think that would be great in a utilitarian sense, and it would be great for the world. Awesome. Jason, thank you so much for your time and for joining us. Really appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to close out on? No, uh, just, uh, you know, we're, we're at WP Engine, we're trying to um, be a part of those good movements of both commercial and higher, <laughs> higher good. <laughs> and that's what we try to do all the time. And so we're trying to be part of it too. So if you like that, then, uh, you know, maybe, maybe we're a company that shares your, your values in that sense. Um, and is also trying to make money like you are and, and like, let's, let's go do all those things together. <laughs> awesome. That sounds like a great idea. Thank you, Jason. Thanks again to Jason Cohen at WP Engine for joining us. And thanks to all of you for joining us here at the WordPress Edge. I am your host, Landon Di Pasquale. And until our next episode, Democratize Publishing. For more information about today's episode and the topics discussed today, check out our dedicated WordPress Edge landing page at AmericanEagle.com Studios.